to do it, I just sort of asked a few people and then asked my adult children. So that's what it that's what it's about. Which one is it? And the next story we're going to tell is the story of the Femedtech Quilt Assemblage. So just to use up this time, um, what we're going to do after that is ask you to... Uh, it's an unfinished story, the second story we'll be giving you. And we would like you to feel free to edit the story, to um, give it whatever ending you like, you know, be involved, be imaginative, but be practical as well. If you have practical issues to do with the what's going to happen next to the Femotech quilt, and that's one of them. So if you can imagine four of those all put together, you'll understand why I only brought one. It was bad enough uh, bringing just one on, on the train. Okay. This is the post-human tale of the good scissors. By post-human, I mean beyond human, or post-human, all too human, as Rosie Bradotti has said. My upbringing in Scotland in the 1950s and later in England with three older brothers was comfortable. We always had enough to eat and were rarely cold, even in the days before central heating. My mother and father grew up in quite different circumstances 34 to 40 years before then, where money was very short, fathers absent, unemployed, we were one generation away from poverty. Both of my grandmothers sewed clothes for their families. At least one with a Singer treadle sewing machine passed on later to my mother and on which I learned to sew age nine. Making clothes from new or used fabric, a practical response to poverty, involves many important non-humans such as patterns, thread, needles, fabric, pins, and more significant investments like a sewing machine and a pair of good scissors to cut fabric and thread cleanly. A story my mother liked to tell from World War II was of the excitement of getting hold of silk from a parachute that could be used for making a romper suit or a wedding dress in the era of make do and mend. I grew up knowing the importance of the good scissors in sewing and making clothes. Scissors and sewing machines were significant inv investments for working class families. The good scissors should never be used for paper as that would blunt them. Their significance and value was reinforced by my mother's horrified reaction if I picked up the scissors to use for anything but fabric. Don't use the good scissors for that. Even more heinous was to use the pinking shears on paper, probably because they would be even more difficult to sharpen. The mother's child scissor fabric paper assemblage was a powerful conveyor of post-human knowledge that lives with me long after her death. The heavy steel scissors from my childhood are long gone, but I respect my current scissors in the same way. My good scissors are a pair of Fiskar scissors about 50 years old. I have a sharpener for them, but I still wouldn't use them for paper. In writing this story, I checked with my own adult son and daughter my son's response was interesting. He knew that you shouldn't use the good scissors for paper, but had no clear memory of me saying it to him. A more recent memory for him is the message being reinforced by his wife, who has become a keen sewist. In contrast, my mother, daughter's response was to laugh and say, of course I remember that, you taught me to sew, and I remember learning to sharpen them if they had been used for paper. <laughs> Stories themselves can be both product and process of cultural transmission. They carry information and the telling of them is a means of passing that on, even if we can remember them differently. If only scissors could speak. <laughs> Ask you about uh, there were so many nods. I, I think it's clearly in quite a few people's uh, memories. So we'll go on to the uh, to the the next story. So the idea of that story was to give you an idea of being free about what's a non-human. We don't really care, you know. Just just go with it. You know, we're all beginners at this. Uh, but and and what I should say, as if anyone was in the session with Catherine, is that. Um, this, um, this, the unfinished story is actually based on a chapter. It's, not really based. it's based on a chapter in, in uh, Laura and Catherine's book. And it's like, 
we got a bit tied up in you know the theory and or, or, you know and we thought could we just do this in a different way and use it as an opportunity for you to bring your great ideas to what we're going to do with um, with the quilts in this different world that we live in from the world in which we envisaged um, those quilts. <coughs> what can we do with them? You know, where can they go? Can they do anything? Can we do nothing with them? And anyway, you'll hear about the digital quilt in the story. So here's the story. Are you going to tell the story, Francis? No, no, no. So Francis wrote a blog. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll share that with you afterwards. Uh, there's a blog that will allow people who aren't in the room to also contribute. And those who were involved in the quilt probably don't, there, were, there, there isn't a recording here, but we could, you know, supply all the information. There's, um, there's, a, there's another post which gives you a bit of background, and I'll share all that on OR23. But do encourage other people to join in if they'd like to, because there's no deadline at the end of today or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, share okay. Here we go. The Unfinished Story of the Femedtech Quilt Assemblage. This is a post-human tale of what? Of Femedtech, of a quilt, and what are those? And who tells their stories? And how? And who will finish these stories? Listen and contribute. Femedtech as at Femedtech, hash Femedtech, Femedtech.net describes itself as a reflexive emergent network of people learning, practicing and researching in educational technology. Before and during OER 19 in Galway, the last face-to-face -face OER conference until OER 23 in Inverness, there was talk of what it meant to be at a conference. Leo Haverman and I explored portals to participation in a blog and FemedTech launched FemedTech Open Space, a spot site where people can contribute without the need to log in, writings that comply with our code of conduct. Then at the conference, Kate Bowles gave a keynote, a quilt of stars, time, work, and open pedagogy that not only used quilt, product and process as a metaphor for OER, but also explored presence, virtual and physical, material and temporal. Femedtech took a look at itself in But What Exactly Is at Femedtech, defining an open distributed network. Kate's keynote, the new Femedtech open space, the analysis of shared curation of at Femedtech, coming together at Galway and online were only some of the inspirations for the Femedtech quilt. Femedtech achieved significant values development activities during 2019. Flowing from these inspirations were posts at Femedtech Open Space and the Femedtech Quilt Project, launched in, two, in November 2019 with the finished quilt due to appear at OER 20. This project offered anyone, whether they attended OER 20 or not, the opportunity to participate via contribution of fabrics or trimmings, made quilt squares, found objects, words, and significantly stories. For Francis, the stories have been a very important part of Femedtech Quilt of Care and Justice. From the launch, the project itself was seen as an activist process and the quilt, later quilts, as material tools of activism, like banners in a protest march. But our world was changing. In January, February 2020, while makers were planning, stitching and sending their squares, travel restrictions to and from China began and cases of COVID-19 started to emerge. Media coverage in countries like China and Italy gave a sense of what might be coming across the globe. There was a stitching day on February the 22nd in Macclesfield, UK, where a group of sewists stitched together the squares into now four quilt tops, one almost 2.4 square 
quilt would have been very difficult and costly to post or travel or display. So we went for the flexibility of four quilts that could be clipped together or displayed separately. A digital quilt was always planned and it grew along with and sometimes ahead of the materials <coughs> quilt being another splot that enables a maker to upload images of squares and their stories without logging in. By February the 10th, 2020, Shauna Brandle was reacting on Twitter to several posted image story contributions to Hashfem EdTech Quilt. There was a buzz online. A maker could have posted their material square across the world to Francis, who would receive it sometime later, and meanwhile upload an image of their square and its story, both of which would appear at the digital quilt as soon as they were checked and approved. Here's a beautiful example from Anne-Marie Scott, who implemented the Splot digital quilt. Visitors can navigate the digital quilt and look at the squares in situ in each of the four quilts with links to images and their stories where available. In March 2020, as Francis was stitching, binding and quilting the four quilts, COVID lockdowns were increasing. The prospect of taking the quilt to OER20 faded rapidly as OER20 morphed and went online. The FemedTech Femed Quilt 60 minute hands-on session planned for OER20 changed into a 30 minute webinar session that included a five minute low tech video of the process of the quilt project. This session appeared to be an emotional experience for participants as though the quilts or possibly the experiences of making a square or engaging with a digital quilt were having a material presence at the online session. During lockdown, learning technologists experienced an increased workload as education pivoted online. Despite this, activism persisted at FemedTech with letters to journal editors, COVID stories, and work associated with a special issue <coughs> on feminist perspectives on learning media and technology. In September 2022, the four FemedTech quilts had their first outing at Alt C22 displayed on tables and held by human hands from a balcony. They attracted interest, especially from those at the conference who had contributed squares. It was imagined that the quilts would contribute to activism, appearing, appearing separately and together at events across the world, but the details were never elaborated. Conferences and events are changing since COVID, and it's time for fresh thinking about the role that the material and digital quilts can play, if any, in future activism in FemedTech and elsewhere. Four minutes later. Okay, four minutes. Yeah, okay. Okay. So um, we um, invite you, and we'll I'll share on um, I'll share share on uh, OER twenty three hashtag to write your own ending to that story. What's going to happen to the quilts next? Be bold, think of alternatives, you know, but also think a little bit about the practicality. Some of you, <laughs> please, some of you, please. But, you know, we want the bold ones as well. So feel free to take a piece of paper and a pencil if you haven't already got one and start to think, well, what could happen to them next? What, you know, where could they go? What could they do? Are they going to stay in a box in my house like they did during COVID? Or are they going to get little outings like this one has got to uh, to this conference? You know, we like to hear, and it's really important, I think, that when I share that web, that um, post, that you explore the digital quilts, because some of you will know that if you go to the image of quilt two, and I'll put a special tweet for that, you can click on quite a few of those, um, quite a few of those squares, and find out their story. And I think you'll love the stories as much as I do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, please, we've got a minute really to scribble down any initial ideas, to pick up the QR code um, and help yourself to some joyful pencils, uh, even a supply pencil sharpness because I can't bear a blunt pencil. Please feel free to take them away, have a look at the books, have a look at the materials.
and we'll just be quiet for a minute and then come back and, and finish off with a call for action. Has everybody got the QR code who wants it? <laughs> Anybody else want a sharp pencil? One of the joys of life, I feel. Thank you. Thank you. Do a sharp pencil? Right. Just give people a minute and then we just yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, I've got some what we're stickers for people. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me when we've got a minute? What I'm actually looking for is volunteers in the network of people who created the squares. Thank you, everybody. We've got one minute left just to really close this. We just wanted to start you thinking. So we've offered the post-human frame to the FEMED Tech Quilt of care and justice. We want your help to write alternative futures for where it goes next. And to recognise, I think, and share the importance of, through the quilt or through whatever practice, stepping outside of the capitalism, the counting, to be able to be inspired. We give thanks to Robin and to Rosie. I'll put that right. And just to finish with Rosie Bray Dotty's words. The sparkle of inspiration is never too far off. The imagination is a force, a faculty, a power, potential, joyful <laughs> activism that can only be ignited and sustained collectively. No one human could have ever made the Femed Tech Quilt. That's the joy of it. Thank you very much for listening. Like this, that was that was created by so participants. And I've got a nice green one. Yeah. Okay. So if you grab me when you see me around, I want to put so a stitch on or a button. You can Cheers, that. That. No, thank you. Oh, <laughs> and I will share the um, I'll share the link on Twitter to the uh, to the post that lets you upload your story. What I should have said was if you upload your story as as it says in that post, I can aggregate all your stories at the end and we can yeah, see them next to each other yeah. on our wonderful open space that uh, Lorna and uh, Alan Levine and others were responsible for. Yeah. Did you just want to post on the right thing? Sorry? Do you just want to post the story? Yeah, if I, if I give you the, um, if I give you the, the post that, 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 that she was showing, it's got everything telling you how to do it. Thank you for coming everyone. Um, I'm here uh, uh, to represent quite a big group of people. So I'm a senior learning technologist at the University of Leeds. I work in biological sciences 
This project has been done with Nick Shepherd, who's an uh, open education advisor in the library, and Chris Hassel, who's an academic in biological sciences as well. Also some postgraduate researchers from biological sciences, a Wikimedia consultant, and creative and production teams um, within digital education. So it's, it's quite a, a range of people have been involved in what I'm going to talk about. It is, what I'm going to talk about is very much a patchwork. Um, I'll be giving you um, views of the whole project and there'll be, there's also resources if you're interested in knowing more that you can go, um, go to later. I'm, um, my background, academic background is um, mathematics and engineering, but also fine arts. So I do believe counting has its place. <laughs> um, <laughs> and can be used for good. And I should say that Research England has, has helped in this project as well. So what I'll talk about, there'll be a Wikimedia recap, um, overview of that, and then the project, how it started, the aims and benefits, an outline of what we've done. Um, the first pilot was last summer, and I'll describe some of those outputs, and the second pilot has just started. Um, so I'll talk about the new, new postgraduates and what they're doing. <coughs> so Wikimedia recap. So I'm curious as to how many people have used Wikipedia so this, this year. Yeah, okay. So it's very widely used. I, I'm new to, I was new to this, this at the Wikimedia side this time last year. So I hadn't realised that Wiki, the Wikimedia movement actually incorporates, I think it's 14 different organisations. There's Wikipedia, which is the, the free encyclopedia. There's Wikimedia Commons, where free-to-use media files are stored, so images and so on, that are then used within Wikipedia. Wikidata, that's open data repository, and Wikisource. Those are the, the four that we've used mainly on the project. And Wikipedia, just a reminder, there's over 300 language editions and there's an, a, a current desire to diversify the contribut contributors and contributions to represent more of the global south and <coughs> also women in science and so on. So an example of how those things can interact, Wikipedia here, an, ex um, an article on uh, Lord Byron, would draw from an image from Wikimedia Commons. Uh, in Wikidata, there'll be data about Byron. And then in Wikisource, there'll be some of his poems. Um, so there'll be entries to the poems there. And as I mentioned, well, um, as we all know, uh, Wikimedia at its heart is open. And at the moment, um, they're wanting, the organisations are wanting to represent more in terms of human diversity, and perhaps after this conference, uh, non-human as well. I did have a conversation yesterday where someone, there was a common saying is you, you don't quote Wikipedia, and yes, that, that, that's not best practice, but as many of you will know, the citations can be useful for students. Um, the Wikimedian in residence we've worked with um, talks about it being a remix culture, so in a sense, Wikipedia, Wikimedia draws together a lot of what is out there and is able to share it that way. An example of just something happening in Leeds at the moment as well, but um, there's a Wikipedian in residence at the National Institute for Health and Care Research because of um, people wanting, say, health data such as relating to COVID, there's a lot of misinformation out there. so. National Institute for Health and Care Research in the UK have, have funded a Wikipedia in residence to look at how Wikipedia might um, contribute to um, good information rather than misinformation. <coughs> so how did this project started, start? Um, I was inspired by the work already done at the University of Edinburgh. I had a a day passing through Edinburgh, and I met up with Melissa Hyten, who unfortunately can't be here. She mentioned what was being done. I looked into it, went back to Leeds. There happened to be a presentation by Nick Shepherd at the university. 
and he said there was a little bit of funding left but needed using by the end of last July. So we had two months and so I came up with the idea, an idea to, to start this project involving postgraduates. Okay. And again, one of the, the examples, there's a podcast relating to this, a BSc in uh, Reproductive Biology at Edinburgh. Students have added, added 22,000 words and 270 references um, in the last, I think it, it was six years, yeah. And that, their students work in groups and, and share the work that they've done. And instead of handing it into a tutor that, and then their work is closed and not seen, it's, um, it's out there and being used. So the aims and benefits that we saw for the work at Leeds um, was to actually eventually bring it into the undergraduate curriculum, although what we've been doing is working with postgraduates initially, and the benefits to students' information literacy, communication skills, teamwork, um, and a greater understanding of open education, and also that, that making a difference, the motivation to make con contributions that make a difference. So what we've had last summer, when I found out there's some funding, we advertise for two postgraduates. Often postgrads do lab work, but we ask them if they'd like to do this work instead. It was paid work for eight weeks, um, began in June, and we had to, at the start of June, and we had to finish most of the work by the end of July. So it was a, a quick project. Uh, it was so successful that the library have now got some more funding. We've now got seven postgrads starting uh, this month, uh, paid work again, we've got more, a bit more time to do the work with them, 60 hours per student, and it's multidisciplinary. So we advertise <coughs> across the university, and we've got four faculties involved. Um, so for the first pilot, we produced first draft of training materials, test cases. So the postgrads were working on cryogenic electron microscopy, <laughs> sustainable crop production because they were from biological sciences and um, also they were interested um, in producing profiles of underrepresented people in STEM. We produced infographics, diagrams and reports and poems as well. Um, we brought in two poems because there was some comms budget free as well and there was a lot of enthusiasm. So here is just uh, one of the postgrads noticed there was a lack. So they were the experts in the subject knowledge. They noticed, <coughs> they decided what area they would like to focus in on. Um, interestingly enough, what was unexpected was how they, instead of text, a lot of them work with diagrams. So they said, this is what we want to convey, but it's not conveyed very well. There were sketches, <coughs> worked with um, a graphic designer and came up with that at the end for uploading to Wikimedia Commons and then including in Wikipedia. Uh, some of these images, it's an interesting case study, are already open source and were available under Creative Commons license. Um, but we added, uh, yeah, created this infographic flow diagram and added some of our own using the graphic design, time that the graphic designer had. Um, there's poems as well. So I've previously worked with poets in, and we brought a couple of poets in, Matt um, Harvey and Fran Francesca Beard, they've both worked in sustainability areas. Um, they chatted with the postgrads, uh, created poems and we recorded them and they've been released under CCBY licence and have entries now in Wikisource. So um, we've probably not time to, to play those now, but links there. Um, yesterday, in time for the conference, we've got a, a podcast which interviews the postgrads as well about their experience. So that's uh, Nick and Chris did the int interview and it's available. The link well, is there in the presentation. Um, so the first pilot, the yeah, there was quite a learning curve. I think it took the postgrads longer to understand how to edit Wikimedia than they, we expected. Um, they did, it, there was a lot of freedom in the project, which was, was great. It's a creative project. So they, as I said, they went into looking at figure legends, adding small 
the details and so on. They had to, one of the things they had to start to be awareness, aware about is conflict of interest. So they had put too many entries that promoted leads um, in some way. <laughs> they, um, there would be problems there. So that's one of the things we have to be careful with when they're editing. Teamwork is very much at the heart of all we're doing. And we were working as a team of equals. I think they were the experts in the subject knowledge. Nick has the experience of Wikimedia. I brought project management to it um, and created work. So um, we also needed to be flexible. We, the postgrads, their, prior, the priority was their studies, obviously. So some, they didn't use as many hours as they'd hoped because of their lab work. So that was always, yeah, this, this work came second. But interestingly enough, um, now the paid work's over, they want to still be involved and they want to contribute. And the idea of bringing postgrads in, they're the future academics, the future lecturers, they'll go out there. They've got that experience now of, of open education and what's involved. And they're ambassadors, they're champions, they work with the new lot of students. So it, it's starting something that will grow. Um, as I said earlier, the interest in images was quite unexpected. Interestingly enough, I, I'm more image with, uh, with fine art background. And it, it tunes in with what I'm interested in as well. If the, the files are in a certain format, those images, it's S SVG format, the images within Wikimedia Commons, the, the, the text on them can be translated into other languages. So you've got an image that you could, it's in English, but then it can be go into Urdu, it can go into um, Tamil, whatever. It's Spanish, Portuguese. So, and that's that's powerful. Then that that doesn't have to be recreated and copied. It's it's there. Um, we did also just realise when we're working with graphic designers, it's making sure their supervisors weren't. Postgrads and um, supervisors approved of them being involved, but they weren't needed generally to check the work because it's all within Wikimedia, it's that whole checking process anyway. But with the graphics, we did need to check that what we were putting a lot of effort into uh, was in line with the academic requirements. Um, and also some, they've learned a lot about copyright as well, including using packages such as bio render and the, the um, copyright issues there. Second pilot student started beginning of April. Just to give you a flavor there, so it's arts, humanities, cultures, um, biological sciences, again, engineering and environment. So these are their areas of interest. So the anti-caste movement um, in Southern India and also this person from India has had experience of uh, mapping content on gender, gender and sexuality in, in, in Indian languages. She's already done with work in Wikimedia in, in India. And someone, so it's, it's very, it's multidisciplinary. It's also multicultural. Um, we've got someone looking at clothing, manufacturers and um, textiles in the UK. And both of these are very interested in hidden histories and getting the, that work up there. Um, so they'll be working as a group on their own projects, but supporting each other quite a few. So DNA, origami, nanotechnology, um, there's a couple of those. One, again, one from India, and he's interested in tracking products for good that use the, the DNA tracking. Um, crop protection applications, uh, ecology, wildlife, management, conservation, and geosciences. A lot of them are relating, link, could link to sustainability thinking and climate change. Um, so yes, so as I said, multidisciplinary, multicultural, multiple languages. We, we also, they've got freedom to explore other languages if you like. And the use of images, again, is cropping up as being important. We've set up a, just practically a team um, where they'll each have their own channel, but there'll be areas where they can ask information about Wikipedia, Wikidata, 
Wikimedia Commons copyright images, infographics. So we're, we're trying to structure how they each each will have their own interests and needs. So this is this is how we've structured um, their support. We'll meet uh, every couple of weeks. Just an overview in case it's of interest as to what roles has been. So Martin Poulter, who's worked as a Wikimedia in, in residence at the Bodleian in Oxford, he, on the first project, we brought him in to do training and also he did give some advice online and we'll be bringing him in again. So we recorded the training he did and we're reusing that. Uh, with Nick Shepherd, as I said, has a lot of open education experience in Wikimedia. He's in the first year of the project, because the project was had to turn around quickly, we focused on biological sciences. So I was recruiting and dealing with the students um, and doing also external comms. Whereas this year, as we've gone more broadly um, across campus, so Nick in the library will, will be recruiting, well, has recruited, done the recruitment and is leading on the admin side. Um, Chris Hassel is great because he's, we're hoping to get some undergraduate resources produced by these postgrads as well. So um, uh, Chris and Martin have had less of a role, but, but key roles as well in that. There is, for those of you that, that aren't aware, there's information on use of Wikipedia, Wikimedia um, in, the, in education. And if this time I could play the poem. Ah, oh, right. Good. I'll go back to the poem then. I, I didn't. What is a wiki and why? Is it more than the communal walk of the woke? Who is it for? The workaday woman, the box standard bloke? It's my understanding each wiki is a gift that exists to be given to and to keep giving. So those who stand on the shoulders of giants can with the boldness of midges share science's teachings and riches. Make what was hidden accessible, ordered. No forbidden forest, but an orchard of knowledge. Make rich the fruit of the orchard less awkward, and where it's applicable, so much more pluckable, and all wisdom's windfalls a bit more pick upable. Hence, this invitation to join in the making, share facts and processes, show where the gnosis is. So, don't let the past mount in twisty ways and become solid. At the last count, there must be 50 ways to share your knowledge. So stick your oar in, Maureen, begin to chip in, Finn, and your two Penneth, Kenneth, share what you know. Because it's people like you, Sue, who start by just starting, Martin, watch a YouTube tutorial, Oriel, and off you go. Fill the gaps in the maps, they're not at capacity, scratch the itch to sew a patch in the tapestry. It isn't a trespass, you don't need a guest pass, knowledge is restless, it's seeking release. So make it plain, Lorraine, then make it plainer. Make it clear, Amir, and then even clearer, Indira. The latest conclusions aren't even conclusive. They may be elitist, but they're not exclusive. So tap those keys, Louise, put flesh on the bone, Joan. Stick up a graph, a garth, it doesn't have to be yours. Each wiki can play host to all sources, well, almost. So long as you signpost, to the primary source and give three notable citations. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a new girl's own, it's your own from home. You've a right to roam and a right to speak. So share the facts, Max. Give them something to ponder, wonder. Add weight to the wiki, Vicky, or give it a tweak. Don't let knowledge go AWOL behind a high paywall. Insist on disclosure. Resist the enclosure of data. Participate in its updating, curating, and in co-creating not just Wikipedia or Wikimedia. Collate a fact sheet, match me. Add nuggets of truth to Ruth, for truth is beauty, Shiruti. 
Citation needed. Give it away, Faye. It's time to share. Claire, you can contribute, commute, all unimpeded. Because you have the how to, the IT, the why to. It's time to pay heed to what's growing inside you, the one unique window that you see the sky through. And do what you need to. Answer the call, Paul. Knowledge has no owner. Shona, open the gate. Kate, let it go free. From the rarest rhizome to the human genome, understanding was meant for you and me. Understanding was meant for you and me. That was brilliant. Really I could play, yeah, Manifold Wonder as well. Seven minutes of talk, but Imagine a breathing in, breathing out, star-blessed planet inhabited by magical creatures like the tardigrada, also known as moss piglets and water bears, who can survive permafrosts, active volcanoes, and outer space. That's our world. Imagine beings capable of destroying paradise with the power of their mind. That's our world. Conjure a world where one user creates something new out of atoms of air, unlike anything else ever before, and others recognize it instantly, add to it, share. That's our world, a super massively subtle, intricate looping dance of energy, cascading, shedding jewels like sequins through the unfurling pattern of perfectly folded proteins. Picture this <laughs> symphony of amazement. See it fragile, witness it going. We need to join forces, pool resources, keep it safe. How? We live so close and so separate. In a kaleidoscopic Venn diagram multiverse of overlapping circles, which in reality might be light years apart, though they still throw shade on each other's planes. Every mortal on this planet seems to be a potential hero and their own worst enemy shining searchlights into the wrong caves. Our story is a long timeline of blokes like Oedipus and Shuangzhu and Hamlet, staring stunned at the stars, wondering, who am I? Why are we? Once upon a dream, we imagined a digital revolution of friendly global villages where everyone took in each other's virtual bins. Human consciousness uploaded into an expanding sphere of universal social literacy. In practice, the solemn reverberations of your most sacred echo chamber are noodled to noise in the hissing stir fry of my social media feed. What if there was somewhere everyone could find a meeting of minds? Where reality wasn't a choice of filters, where cancel culture transitioned into peer review, where the names of new proteins, Fiona One, Shrek, Topless, were household as Love Islanders and creative commons viral as Kim Kardashian. Imagine a database of shared ownership made not for profit, but to profit all. What if? Like penguins in the frozen waste, we could weather this climate crisis by time-sharing center stage. Shuffling the pack, the high-low ace, no one edged out, marginalized, so we all survive with access for all to the inner circle. Each of us with a seat at the table, everybody able to bask in the warmth of knowing we all know we are in the same storm and the same boat. That when we share knowledge, it flows, carries us to where we need to go. Let's dream of a world where right now, 
a kid in Alaska and two in Nairobi and one in Sydney by way of Karachi are uploading scientific data from Wikimedia to their brains, freely streaming information translated by early career researchers that will lead them to cross-reference, follow sources, edit, contribute, collaborate, and meet face-to-face -face in a lab in Leeds, where they will find a cure for the cancer that killed your great-grandmother that will save your granddaughter. Believe that for a fact. Here's a fact. Facts leave us cold, stone-faced. It's stories that change landscapes. From the Stonehenge circles to the Easter Island statues, we move mountains when we believe. But we need new stories. Because the ones we have now, the ones about how a brighter future is our destiny, how we stand on the shoulders of giants to see not just further but better, that's post-truth, that's fake news. There is no happy ever after, no mystical fairy tale millennium where we all wear silver. If we want progress and change, we need to change how we progress. The old stories about a singular savior rising heroic out of a crowd have brought too few of us too far, too fast. We need a new story about how we move as one, slower, surer, further. It's not about a thousand millionaires rocketing to Mars, it's about Five billion citizens supporting science to nurture drought-resistant plants. We have the technology. We have the wherewithal. We need the collective will. And that's down to you and me, ordinary, extraordinary human beings. That early career researcher in a Leeds lab uploading her images to Wikimedia. A secondary school teacher, wiki user, who knows how to explain DNA to RNA so that any 12-year-old can start to figure out who am I, why are we? It's about baseline knowledge, everyone on common ground, across cultures, currencies, and mother tongues. What if this is a world where we are all the hero and the storyteller, where we all help each other to make our stories truthful and free? Imagine if we all come together to share those stories on Wikimedia. What a wonderful world this would be. Any questions then? Okay. I love that your, your students sort of self-selected diagrams and, and visual representations. And you mentioned how those are relatively Um, the, the students that are starting have a range of languages and we've given them the option to work on those translations. So that's something we'll really be encouraging. And it's it's a certain format that allows that. That's the SVG format. Anything else? Great. Okay, thank